Welcome everyone to the March 20th, uh, 2019 Charter Commission meeting. It's 8 a.m. on March 20th. Um, we'll call this meeting to order and we will do a roll call. Um, Dan, do you have a list that you can do a roll call with, please? Or Thank you. Um, the first item on the agenda is to approve our minutes of the January 15th, 2019 minutes. Um, they're included in your packet, and along with that, um, Doug Fagerly wanted his uh, notes that uh, he spoke on at that last meeting. Uh, we unfortunately did not have a video of that meeting or an audio recording of that meeting, but we do have our minutes. And um, for those that were here, Doug stated some of his concerns on his uh, exiting interviewer, I guess, or, um, so um, I guess I would entertain a motion if you have seen those and went through those um, on the approval of the minutes, it, whether you would like to uh, uh, add these to our minutes or not. I don't have a copy of the minutes. I don't either. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I move to approve the minutes. With the addition of these notes? Okay. Do I hear a second? Second by Russ. I have not had a chance to read them. I just mailed off them. If you could give me a minute, I'd like to keep I sure can. While you're reading, I'd just sure. like to make a comment that if if they could be changed, when you print them off, they come out, when you're reading, it's really difficult because they come out item one, item two, mm -hmm. item three, item four, item seven of your new business, then it switches back to item five, six, eight. And really, Somebody in the future searching would be nice to have those. Yes, I can do. No big deal. Was that? <laughs> did we? I'm, I'm trying to remember. Did we? Um, no, did we? Ch did we change the order of that during our agenda, the approval agenda, maybe? And that's well, why that happened. No, because it's item four is old business, mm -hmm. and item five is old business, so it's unfinished business. But they're separated by item seven. Okay. Which is new. I was just wondering if we had moved item seven up for any particular reason on the agenda, but then it, I guess. Yeah, we still, we still. In process. Been okay. We'll remember that for Okay. And we do, uh, we do have a quorum here today, and I just do want to point out, um, while Athena's going over the minutes, um, our absentee policy for uh, being on the commission is attached um, to some of your pamphlets here. I can't remember which one. But um, it's up to the secretary, and uh, Julian, you're our secretary. The people that aren't show up call and see if maybe they didn't get an email or weren't notified, because um, it's always nice to have a, a full of board as we can. Right, if notification wasn't um, efficient this time, then yep. maybe we, we'd have to consider that yep. in, their, in their absence today. Well, yes, exactly. <coughs> so. <coughs> and sometimes with new, new members and new emails, it might get locked in their spam or something, so, Corey? I just had one question on uh, Mark Bachlund. Uh, he's sworn in as an at-large member, but uh, he's board three. I don't know if that was talked about the last piece. I'm wondering if, if it's wrong in the minutes, if 
No, what happened there is Mark was uh, appointed to fill a position that was an at-large position until January. And then um, as of January, uh, he was appointed to Ward 3. Okay. So actually, he f during the, before that meeting, he was fulfilling uh, the role at, 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 at the at-large okay. number. Yep. And that's why the change. I want to make sure it was correct. So we have a first and a second on the minutes. Uh, any other discussion or questions on the minutes? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Uh, minutes are approved. Uh, any reports from the chair, officers, commissioners, or committees? Seeing none, um, public comment, we always leave a little time for anybody that's in the audience that would like to uh, make a comment on something that is not on the agenda. If there's something on the agenda, we can wait till that item is brought up. But um, if there's anybody in the audience that has anything they'd like to speak on now, seeing none. Um, We talked about, um, should we, uh, well, let's go right away with, um, I'd like to adjust the amend amendments a little bit since we do have guests. We, so, Mark Nisbet, we're going to, uh, Mark, you're the chair of the, yeah. oh, okay. Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, maybe if we could, we move to item three first so our guests, uh, we can accommodate our guests a little bit and then we can move back to item two. So. Yeah, it's very fine. Welcome aboard. <laughs> so I guess I will let uh, Ms. Wilkers uh, do the introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commission members. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning. Um, so um, last time you had a memo from me requesting um, that the Charter Commission um, consider changing the charter, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me um, to allow for the council to, or for the city of Moorhead to be members of the chamber. Um, I gave you some information and a, a, a lot of um, background on this last time, and we had a, a AG opinion from many, many years ago, and the League of Minnesota Cities sent out a reminder in 2018 that the cities um, in the state of Minnesota could not be members of their local chamber unless they had, were a charter city, which we are, and unless a charter specifically allowed the city to be a member of the chamber. Um, I did outline a lot of um, thoughts and suggestions and um, considerations for you on why I did think the city should be part of the chamber, should be allowed to be part of the chamber. We're actually not asking today for that authority. We're asking that you change the cha charter to allow the city to council to make the decision every year whether they want to be part of the chamber. Um, those were the, the memo I sent to you with the comments were a compilation of comments I had from the city council and from others in the community. And since then, we went to the um, city council meeting on March 11th, and we asked the city just, and, and this is not necessary as part of your process, but we wanted you to have the comfort that the city was asking you to consider um, adding the, the um, ability to be members of the chamber to the charter, and they did pass that motion. So it's coming back to you today for consideration. And with that, um, I do have, um, we did ask for three um, kind of um, local um, participants in the chamber to, to um, be able to address you today. Um, we got Mark Nisbet from Excel Energy, he's also chamber of the chair board, or chamber board. We have Jim Parsons, who's a member of the chamber, or uh, employee yeah, of the chamber, sorry, sorry. And then we have um, Doug, I can't remember, rest of my air. Is it Mayor or Meyer? Meyer, Meyer who is DNS Beverage C um, owner, so and a local business um, partner and of the city. And Dave Anders. Dave. Hi, Dave. Sorry. Would you like to pull up a chair? Uh, I'm good. <laughs> okay, Dave Anderson, who's also on the board. Is that right? Uh, I'm not on the You're board. You're not on the board Sanford. anymore? <laughs> Sanford, yeah. So we have a, another local participant here. So with that, um, Jim, did you have anything else? I do not. Um, 
I could hear. Uh, I'm, I guess we're willing to hear some of the uh, uh, from our guests today on uh, the. Yeah. I'll, I'll start it off, Mark Nez, with current chamber chair of the board and uh, strong supporter of the chamber and what it's done and the interaction it gives us in the community of Moorhead. And, uh, Mark, All right, there. Uh, Mark Nisbet, uh, Chamber Chair. Uh, uh, we serve in Moorhead Natural Gas. Uh, we serve in the surrounding communities. I have the, uh, the pleasure of uh, being part of the, the executive board, and I think we're uh, uh, doing great things within the chamber and our inclusivity. Um, uh, it, what we're trying to accomplish. The Chamber is, of course, a business organization, but businesses more and more realize that they're not going to be successful unless their members uh, are able to uh, educate and work with the community, provide the services needed. So I, I definitely think it's a, a benefit for both the communities and the Chamber and uh, the long relationships we've had within this community. and. Um, so um, Craig Whitney would be here today other than this was a, a scheduled time uh, away with his family so he couldn't make it so he asked me to be here and uh, assembled people that uh, have a stake in Moorhead maybe Doug at this point with with his business as well and maybe it's easier just to ask us questions if if there are specifics that are are bothersome or even why something like this would be on the book so uh, Chris appreciate you moving it forward and giving us this opportunity so uh, well I'm Doug Restemeyer I'm, I own and operate uh, DS beverages uh, been a chamber member for as long as I can remember I was on the board for six years I think I served as chair back in 2015 or somewhere in that vicinity so a very active member of the chamber or a community builder within the chamber I don't want to to uh, belabor the point but uh, you know we truly believe in the chambers work and we wouldn't be a, a you know a strong member if we, if we didn't. I could go on and on in terms of the the advantages that the chamber offers to a business like mine, and uh, you know some of it is the training that they provide. And a lot of it's the information they provide, the meetings, the uh, the uh, state of the cities. I, I mean, literally, I, I couldn't imagine uh, the city of Moorhead not being a member of the chamber. It. Uh, I mean, if you look at, I don't know what we'd call the chamber, it's the Fargo Moorhead West Fargo Chamber at this point. Our logo has three interconnecting circles. <clears throat> it wouldn't look very good with two. Uh, but really, from my standpoint, uh, it's, it's the benefits that are provided by the, by the chamber. And, and it's been doing great things in the last 10 years. Uh, uh, it's done phenomenal uh, work, I believe. And, in attracting companies and helping companies that are already here, um, and, and a lot, and some even small things like simple ribbon cuttings at, at uh, events to make it extra special. So that's my endorsement for the chamber, and I'd be happy to ask any questions you have of me also. And Dave, as long as you pulled up a chair, I, I think Sanford. Yeah, I just kept insisting that I could. Yeah, all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think the only thing I would add is that, that we don't succeed by ourselves. You know, the city doesn't succeed by itself. The chamber doesn't succeed by itself. Sanford doesn't succeed by itself. It's, it's about collaboration. It's about working together. You know, we don't fight floods, you know, one at a time, each of us all by ourselves. We do it together. You know, we don't cut ribbons by ourselves. We do it together. Um, you know, it, it, it has always been what we do in Fargo-Moorhead. We work together. We, 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 we come together in the tough times and we come together in the good times and, and we've grown together because we, we lift together and we do those things together. Um, it, it, it seems to me ridiculous that we even have to have the conversation, but we do uh, based on, on what uh, the statutes are telling us. And so we're here to see if we can't repair that. So uh, that, that, would, that would be uh, really all I have to say. Thank you. Anything to add? Well, uh, I've been an employee for the chamber for 19 years, so I'm probably the historian of late. But, um, you know, we are a regional chamber. The river, even though it divides us, can't divide us. So um, consider more of a vital part of that uh, existence of, for our organization. So, and we want to be here to support everybody. Well, um, 
A couple of points on my side before uh, I take some of the commission's questions. Um, first of all, uh, I I agree. I mean, I think the chamber's a great organization, and I I don't know the reasons why we wouldn't allow the city to be a, a member. Um, I don't know why that statute exists. I guess um, that that would be the question I'd want to know. I mean, for what reason wouldn't you allow your council to be a member? Uh, but on the other side, too, I can ask, um, um, we have certain, I mean, the, our Moorhead EDA is a member. I think Moorhead Public Service is a member. Uh, not sure Downtown Moorhead Inc., if they're a member. I know Dave's on the board over there. Um, but in asking that question, are, is, is Moorhead already represented very well? I, that would be my question also. Um, but uh, those are my two points. Um, mm -hmm. Any other commissioners have any questions or statements? Uh, yes, thank you. I've got just one question, and that is, I'm guessing that we've been, as a city, a member for a long time. What involvement do we see city employees in the current chamber? Or maybe even one step further, anticipating into the future, if it's allowed, and if the council chooses to be a member, what kind of uh, involvement would you hope that city employees would be in? Well, I, I realize currently, you know, um, we have State of the Cities where all three more heads represented very well there. Um, we've, uh, as far as the employees, we also are a member of the Minnesota Greater partnership which helps on the uh, lobbying side of for the city of Moorhead which I don't know if that would continue if that's if, if we're not a member or if this city's not a member but we this last uh, um, January we we invite we have a Minnesota processions priority down in the cities that I know Ms. Volker uh, Participated along with Dave Lapointe, um, which is not probably typical of uh, the Minnesota Chamber having that access. But they were, because of their affiliation with us, we we extended the offer to come down there. So, and I guess I would maybe ask Chris, what would you like your employees to do? We have a lot of very engaged committees. I just stood up a people of color committee, military committee, ag committee, all things of interest in businesses that drive your community, the young leadership, uh, where, where I'm sure we engage the mayor in the efforts to explain to those members who are involved. So lots of opportunities for growth for your employees, the trainings that are offered, being a member, the reduced uh, the, the reduced admission price, uh, the, the concept that uh, eggs and issues, Dave and I are co-sponsors of that, and, and the issues that we're addressing, attracting different type of members to each of the meetings. So we're, we're working hard. We have a very active board. We take into consideration. So I, I didn't give out my Moorhead Proppers or Moorhead State graduate, and, and you know, with the president of Moorhead State, uh, President Blackhurst on the board, and uh, and again, Doug uh, representing those business interests. I certainly care what happens in the in the uh, community of Moorhead and where we're going. And, and I think um, it, uh, Dan and I were just sort of speculating on, on what it could be. Was um, was there some fear that uh, uh, the chamber is just a Republican organization? Well, if uh, if people that have have different opposing views are afraid of joining in and expressing their positions uh, but we're about business we're not about a political party we're <clears throat> about what understanding makes uh, communities a, a great place to live work and play I'm stealing that line from Dave but uh, <laughs> at, at any rate uh, the concept being is I think we're growing as an organization and understanding uh, uh, our members don't want all don't all want exactly the same things and we need to listen to a lot of them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to claim we're the largest chamber uh, in Minnesota, in the region, because of, uh, of the, uh, the huge growth we've had in our membership and, and the divergent uh, uh, people that we represent. We've had, uh, we've had meetings on uh, the issues of homelessness, uh, crime, your, uh, you know, your 
uh, uh, supported your uh, law, uh, uh, your new, um, do we call it the law center there? I've, I've been at meetings there and I uh, think uh, aware that it'll be the center for your flood, flood fight. So at any rate, Moorhead is a huge part and a huge part of the history of the, of the chamber and, and we just think it would be a shame and uh, lost opportunities to visit with members of, uh, of your community. Chris. Sorry, thanks, Mr. Chair. In answer to you, Mark, um, thank you. Uh, I didn't want to repeat everything in my memo, but if I could just take a second and tell you what we, the realities of what we do um, utilize and, and partner with the Chamber on. As we grow Moorhead, for example, we're opening new businesses and they, the Chamber always has their, um, um, what do you call it? The group Ambassador. ambassadors that yep. come and do the ribbon cutting and they are supportive, they help set up, they, they, they participate in that entire thing. The, the council, myself, and our department heads often every month go to the eggs and issues it's a huge learning opportunity we're very grateful to be invited and pay the reduced cost on that we participate in um, many 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 of their educational events my executive assistant my former one for example went through your young leadership academy and i was very grateful for that um, there are just there are many 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 reasons um, the legislative advocacy for example um, jim is right we just went down to st paul derek lapointe and i from downtown moorhead Inc. drove all the way down to st paul one day for the dinner and we're welcomed and, and participate with all the leaders, the new commissioners, the governor, and legislators. And we sat with our legislators and we participated and we're able to advocate for what Moorhead needs legislative mm -hmm. um, in terms of legislative issues. And um, the chamber invited us to that event. We were able to participate. The last thing I'll say is we're about to enter a flood event. And with that flood event, um, we're, we're asking the chamber to, to do a call, help us with the call out for volunteers for the sandbagging and we need their support and partnership and they reach areas that we that there's all kinds of ways to reach people through the schools the colleges the businesses and the chamber is another and and as a Fargo Moorhead West Fargo Chamber I can't imagine not being part of that so that's my opinion and uh, I'm going to Athena first you had a question or statement I have questions. okay Well, so the state auditor has taken different positions over time regarding uh, different public expenditures, and there was a question regarding uh, why is this coming up now. Um, in the last couple of years, the state auditor has actually brought suit against a number of entities regarding their public purpose expenditures. Um, and it could be something very minor or it could be something very major. And the league sent out uh, a memo uh, inciting to some other material and we researched the issue. And um, statutory cities don't have the authority to enter into chambers. Uh, but the AG said, if your charter provides that you have that authority, you can go ahead and be a member of the chamber. And so we brought this to the Charter Commission, simply asking the Charter Commission to consider it. Uh, keep in mind, this isn't actually making the decision to become a member. This is only giving the city the option to be. Uh, you know, thinking long term, you could have a council in 10 years decide not to be a member, or they could be a member. It's just simply giving them that authority to make that decision. So. Do you have any understanding about the reasoning for the statute? Um, prohibiting cities from um, buying memberships into organizations like the chamber yeah the the general principle is that when you have when you're in charge of public dollars whether that be revenues tax dollars special assessments etc the expenditure of public funds needs to be for a public purpose uh, it is generally viewed that membership in a chamber would not necessarily be for a public purpose uh, because it represents its lobbying activities, its other issues. Uh, and so that is kind of the position that has been taken. Uh, when you, whenever you look at a public expenditure, you have to determine whether or not there's a statute in place, whether or not there's a charter, a, a charter provision that authorizes it, or uh, if the entity has that authority. Like a good example is uh, the, uh, Economic Development Authority, by its very nature and its statutory authority, has the authority to enter into those types of arrangements. It's just the city 
absent a charter provision would not. And so that's, that's why we're in front of the Charter Commission asking for it. So if the Economic Development Authority has a membership and is able to do so, why does the city need a membership? Well, that's, that's a, I would deem that to be a policy question. Uh, the real question before the Charter Commission is, do you, do you want to give the City of Moorhead the authority to be a member? It's not actually deciding the underlying question of, do they want to be a member? It's, do you want to give them the authority to be? Right, and I, I'd like to understand the reasoning for why they would need to be a member, since we already have a group that is a member. I, I, I defer to the City Manager on that. Sure. Well, the the, the <laughs> economic development is a member through the city's membership so there is actually it's kind of we call it an additional uh, listing or additional add-on to the membership so the their dues are actually part of the the cities along with the uh, the park uh, the the parks um and the fire department the police department all get wrapped up into the city's component of that those dues okay, so. i'm going to defer because that that's a point um so you're saying we right now we're only paying the one membership? We're not paying the EDA is not paying a separate membership. No, that's con not as a separate. It's it's tagged into the city of Moorheads right now. Okay. What is the cost? The cost is right now is twenty two thousand four hundred forty dollars. For the city to be a member of the correct. And, and, and Mr. Chair and, and and Jim's exactly right. That is a city. There's affiliate members and all the other the mentions of department heads or the departments, excuse me, and EDA are affiliate members that go along with that. I believe MPS has their own membership. They would not be able to do that with the if if the authority isn't allowed for the council to make the decision whether to be a part of the chamber. Um, the the Moorhead Public Service is deemed a city or a department of the city legally, okay. so they would not be able to continue their membership either. How about the EDA? Would they be able to con continue? I'm assuming so. The EDA is a separate political subdivision. But the funds would have to come out of the EDA. Correct. Could um, parks and everything else come out of that as an affiliate member too then? or No, no they're part of the it'd city. It would be just the EDA. It wouldn't be a city membership. And I think my, one of my questions is, is um, what would we lose by not being a member as a city? And I think you answered some of those questions, Chris. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of interrupted you. Do you have any more? Uh, um, well, I guess I have kind of a general um, question. It sounds like uh, we already have the EDA who is a member and is able to be so separately yes. from the city. Okay. Um, and since they're an economic authority that makes perfect sense given that the chamber um, works for the benefit of businesses um, I guess my concern is what you mentioned a little bit about lobbying and um, what the ethical ramifications of of it would be for the city to be a member of an organization that really does um, promote that is uh, has policy attitudes that are anti-labor and we have a whole city full of um, employees who are members of four different labor unions. How does that reflect on the, the city of Moorhead to be a member of an organization that does not promote um, labor very well and that actually is lobbying to work uh, to, for right to work laws and uh, some restrictions on overtime pay. It's, that's an issue that's um, currently an issue right now with the administration too so for sure i would also defer to um former mayor mark Foxland here but i would all, i would say that really what we're asking before you again is just for the authority for your elected officials to make that decision and they are the elected officials and they are the policy makers so they would have to make that decision whether to join the chamber based on that information and that input your elected officials are elected for that reason and they are the policy makers and they would have to make the decision if you allow them to make the decision and that is what we're asking today and that's to get us kind of back on track and that's all that would happen today we would have to ask john to uh write up a, a an amendment to the to the charter it would have to come back to us to approve this amendment and to send it to the city council they have to 
vote 100 percent, including the mayor, to approve that charter change. So um, we basically, I mean, to narrow the scope here, are just sending that back to the city for them to make that decision. Um, we are not changing the charter ourselves. We are just allowing them to look at it, basically. And again, they would have to vote 100 percent on that. So. Is there language that has been drawn up and drafted for the uh, charter um, charter language change? Um, no, you would need to direct me to do that. It's mm -hmm. it's actually a really easy charter change. It's just giving the authority to the council to be a member of a chamber or a similar organization. Uh, it and I would draft that and bring it back to your next meeting. I I would say from my standpoint as city attorney. I always like giving the city as much powers as it can. It doesn't mean that they have to take advantage of them, but having that authority in place gives the elected leaders the opportunity to have that policy level discussion and to make those decisions in the future. Because they, they could decide one year that they don't want to be members, and two years later they could decide they want to be members again. So. Would, um, would the city manager be able to... Um, um, maintain an individual um, membership in the city, uh, in the Chamber of Commerce, and still be able to do the kinds of activities and be involved in the kinds of activities you have been without the city itself needing to have a membership? No. This, the city manager, uh, unless the city manager was paying for it out of her personal dollars, um, you couldn't use, the, the issue is the use of uh, authorization for the public right. funds. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, Mark, you served as mayor for many years. I mean, and I'm assuming we we're uh, chamber members all the way back then too. Um, um, do you have any insight on the benefits and, or well, maybe not benefits? One of the things I'd like to point out, uh, my company was a member of the Moorhead Chamber of Commerce years and years ago and was part of the change when Fargo and Moorhead Chambers came together. And I think one of the things you have to keep in mind with our, with the chamber of today for Fargo, Moorhead, and West Fargo is totally different than most chambers in Minnesota in the fact that it's not a small town type of an operation. It's not just looking at businesses for business's sake. It's looking at things like how do we develop our employee force? How do we make our middle managers better? We have training, they have training programs for it. How do, we, how do we make businesses more effective? How do we get businesses more involved in community? Those are the kinds of things that this Chamber of Commerce does because it's a regional chamber that a Chamber of Commerce, for instance, just in Detroit Lakes doesn't do. And I think that's where, personally, I think that's where the strength of being a member of the chamber would lie for the city of Moorhead is and that's where I why I wanted to hear their answer on what how it would help individuals because we have a lot of middle management people we need places for them to train this is a very good and inexpensive outlet and again I just think that uh, we have to keep in our mind focused on we aren't we aren't doing anything today except maybe allowing city council to make these kinds of decisions. Good points, Mark, and I, I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. That basically, yes, let's get that maybe a little bit back on track. The motion today would be, what we would be looking for if that was the case, is just for John, our city attorney, to write something up, uh, a change to the charter, and then we would approve and then send it back to the city and they can make up their mind whether they want to be a, a member of the uh, Chamber of Commerce or not. So um, we're not here to decide whether they should be a member. We're here, here to decide whether they should have the choice to be a member. So um, with that, uh, Julian. Hi, thanks. Uh, well, first off, thanks for taking time out of your schedules to come chat with us and walk us through this stuff. I did have a couple questions 
Uh, one is, you know, especially considering that we have multiple entities that are potentially members or, you know, I could see that very easily as a Venn diagram with employees and stuff. How can we make sure that we're not, like, doubling up on membership, if that makes sense? So, like, by having separate memberships for EDA, MPS, and the city, um, how do we... How do we ensure that we're not, you know, paying two memberships for one staff member? Do uh, you have an answer for that? I'm, I'm going to let Jim. <laughs> so as, as uh, Chris was explaining, there's affiliation. So there is one membership for the city of Moria, which covers um, multiple, like the city, the police department, the fire department, the parks and recreation and stuff. So as we have memberships, that those that due structure changes so those allows access for all those individuals to have the opportunities to do training and different things if we limit it to just the city then it'd be the city employees that are probably contained within just this the facility of, of city versus the park district and different places so um well, I guess my, my question is so. if, if there's like a city employee who sits on the EDA or is a uh, part of MPS you know, can we make sure that they're maybe kept to one membership and that type of thing? Because I mean, that stuff does happen. Yeah, and, we, and that can be possible. Possible. That's so, so it could be possible. Right. To, it, like, double the, down. Historically, that uh, more in public services had a separate membership from the city. So that's yeah. that's all. That's all been. Commissioner Dahlquist, if I might uh, jump in as well, um, it's not going to break the chamber's bank account if MPS is not a, an individual member. Um, you know, over the years that I've been involved with the chamber, I've, I've sat on a lot of committees where a lot of representation comes from the city to, to you know, to discuss whatever the issues might be. Um, I've been one in, in my years on the Maury Public uh, Service Commission uh, that insisted that we get more involved in, in things like economic development and growing our town because I didn't believe that we were. And so, you know, I've, I've insisted that, that, we, that we get to the table and that we spend more time uh, as, as an active participant in, in the efforts to grow the community. Um, uh, if, if this is going, if, if this became a single membership that, uh, that was under the auspices of the city council and the city manager's office, fine. You know, that, that, that's not going to affect their bank account that much, and that's not, not going to affect our, our access to the organization to be to be participants in it so you know i i i understand your question and, and your concern uh but there are so many things that 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 we have been involved with over the years uh whether it is uh the the growth of our of our industrial park or whether it's protecting our, our community from the river when when it threatens or whether it's growing the workforce and i'm really glad you brought that up mark because Workforce is, is maybe the most critical economic question that we have in this valley right now. It's not water. It's not too much water or too little water. It's people. That's pretty close in my book. It's pretty close. Yes. Yeah. It's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. But it's people. Uh, and, and we are really short of people. And so whatever it is that we can do on a lot of fronts to, to grow this, this valley and, and the population and the workforce, you know, that, that's probably the most important thing we can be doing. And a follow-up, if I may. Um, uh, you know, in because I'm, you know, I ask mainly out of you know fiscal responsibility, and and running our, our city as efficiently as possible. Um, you know, one question I would have then is, you know, if if the city were not a member, or even if, you know, none of the three entities that we've talked about with regard to the city were members, would that exclude the city and its staff from being part of these? Uh, commercial discussions and talking about development and economic uh, advancement within the city? I, I would say what it would mean is they wouldn't be asked to sit on committees or given that opportunity. You can still, we invite everybody to all of our events and you can pay a non-member entrance which uh, uh, you know can add up quickly. Uh, I hadn't been aware of what the membership uh, price was and I think that's quite a bargain with the different events going on. Women Connect, the new uh, People of Color Policy Committee, uh, 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 Ms. Grazik talked about um, uh, uh, 
uh, labor, uh, our company um, has union employees, so we talk about those issues. There's a broad spectrum when we sit down and talk about those policies and, and where we would end up growing the opportunity for, uh, uh, for that labor force, as Dave said. Are, are we finding the right type of jobs where we can raise those right. incomes, where, where all of a sudden the, the concept of minimum wage uh, shouldn't... Uh, if, I don't think anybody's paying minimum wage here anymore. So the idea that uh, if we continue to work, continue to create opportunities, be supportive of, uh, of programs that help uh, people deal with the issues that they're facing in their everyday life. So it just, I was going to say in the short time, <laughs> In the short 40 years I've been short involved 40 years in chambers, you've been uh, you know, between uh, uh, Grand Forks and uh, yeah. in Minot and here, uh, the, the concept of the ability to broaden our topics uh, has grown immensely from maybe a single focus to much more understanding uh, what it takes to have a strong community and to have people participating. So I'm very pleased with uh, the progression and where chambers are going and uh, uh, these eggs and issues, we get people from all sides of the spectrum, and the questions that are asked cause us all to think. So I, I think I think that's the beauty of being a member. I think what you would lose is the ability to change or help society change and address some of these issues over time. A seat at the table is always better than ha having to try to uh, try to affect change from outside. So no, I agree, and I, yeah. you know, not to you know uh, try and. Um, push weight around, so to speak, with with the the clout that we have on this commission. But it would it would you know as someone who's who's looked into starting a business down the road, um, it, it would seem advantageous to give a city a seat at the table or multiple seats, uh, depending on even without a membership. It just it just strikes me as odd to uh, potentially you know the way we're talking about it exclude. A governing entity that can affect policy um, uh, in in uh, absence of a membership, and, and is that essentially what would happen then? I believe it would. That, that could be a possibility. I mean, you have city of Fargo and city of West Fargo that are members. It gets a little difficult to say, okay, well, we'll invite you to the table, and you're not on the same level. In, awesome. in hopefully some of those ideas would bubble up through the businesses that are members in town and understanding what's good for the community. So I, I think we would, uh, I, I still think we would hope for the best for the community, but it, it just is uh, sort of a fact of life. Those people that want to belong and be involved, in, in our view, it's just the, the commitment in helping us do the right things and be engaged in those efforts. Thank, thank you for that. Um, and then another question I had is, you said that the cost for the city membership would be two thousand four hundred and forty dollars, right? The cost is based on a number of employees. Okay, that's how we're. So even if when you talk about the more public service, we take in consideration their employee count and roll it. And would together. that would that count? Uh, say so that's just the total number of staff. Employed by all, and we have a structure for that. So. And so, so going back to my question, if there was a, someone that was working for maybe the city and Moorhead Public Service, would they count as two staff members or one? No, or? I mean we we would just take into consideration numbers. Okay, so. um, and the reason I bring that up is uh, I I tried to check out your guys' website, and there's nothing with regard to dues. Or yeah, we we don't publish our dues structure on. Just because it's 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 set in tiers. It's not per employee. It's what do you mean it, with tiers? Tiers, so like a zero or one to nine is this rate, so that uh, people, businesses have the ability to grow and oh, shrink. Well, I'm, I'm curious, what, what's the one to nine? Mean? One to nine employees. Is oh, okay. Three hundred thirty-five. Oh, that was just a scale of. Well, <laughs> so then the next one is ten to nineteen. You know, twenty to twenty-nine. Then, then as larger companies, it's and if changed, what you're so. driving at is, are, are we asking the cities to pay more than members? And I can say categorically, not as a, a private sector business. Okay. And, and Chris would certainly have access to see what the what the dues structure is, and that it looks to me like a good deal, is what I would say. Yeah, no, so. and that's why I ask because I mean, yeah. you know, it, it seems to me that if you want to, I mean, and and maybe we have a difference of. A 
opinion, but if you want to expand membership and and be open and transparent, then you should disclose that, you know, because, I mean, when we have a situation like this, when you're asking us essentially, um, or encouraging us, I should say, to make a decision regarding membership for an, an entity that we're, at the end of the day, a part of, um, that, uh, you know, if we don't know what the, the dues structure is, that makes it a little more difficult, in my opinion. Um, and so, going back to what you said about you have different tiers, how many different tiers are there for membership dues? I'm going to say there's probably 12 to 13 or so. And then that, that changes the cost or the, the membership? It's, it's based on the size. But we also have a different structure for hotels and different structure for financial institutions. And why, why, why is there that difference for different institutions? Because of... Uh, I guess it's kind of historically how it's been, but it's based on their access and the accessibility to the members and stuff. So I like um, I'm, I'm, I want us to get back on track here because I, I, we're trying. I think we're getting there. We're trying to decide if we should join. We're not. We're trying to decide if we should give the council the ability to join, and th that would have to go to them. And we'll um, just one quick question: if they if we approve this charter. Uh, change, they have to vote at 100%. But on a yearly basis, then they will decide whether they want to be a member or not. That yep. does not have to be 100%. I would assume. Correct. Yeah. I mean that 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 would be. But but it's still up to elected officials, the ones that we elect, whether to be a member or not. And that's the question before us. And that's what I I think we need to focus on here: whether we should give the ability, the council to make that decision on their own. So. Yeah, and, and just to respond to a, a previous previous speaker that, um, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us as really one of one of the checks and balances of our local government to go over this stuff, and I don't um, I don't agree with the the sentiment that some have expressed with minimizing the decision that's in front of us because we have four members of leadership of a, I would say, a powerful organization. I mean, you guys do a lot of stuff, and I'm appreciative of that. But it's not a minor thing, you know, if we have four people of leadership from this organization coming in to lobby for it, you know? And so I think we should be asking questions. You know, if we're uh, removing, essentially, uh, one of the checks and balances from the power structure in our city with regard to this subject, and we have leadership coming to discuss it, you know, we should talk about the money because, at the end of the day, as the previous uh, secretary of, or the attorney general stated in their uh, statement, that you know you shouldn't be writing essentially blank checks. And you know, I, I understand that that's a process that happens sometimes. But like even with regard to a historical society, as was mentioned in that letter, and thank you, uh, uh, manager, for sending that out to us, it was very helpful. Um, you know, that you, you can't pay dues even to a historical society unless there's a list of what the city will be receiving from that. And I haven't, I haven't seen that, and if, there, if that exists, that would be very helpful too, but uh, I don't feel prepared at this point, um, I guess to sum up my, my sentiment, uh, I, I don't feel prepared, especially with how many people are here, even though we have quorum, but uh, I don't feel like I'm in a sufficient spot to advance this especially with regard to removing, like I said, one of the checks and balances uh, on, on this issue. Okay. But again, our, our responsibility is the charter, not what the council decides to vote on. So. But the charter is the basis upon which the council functions. The, the council functions according to the charter, correct? <clears throat> have to adhere to the charter. Uh, what we would be doing is just giving them the ability to make that decision on their own. Um, one of the things that could happen here today is if, if some, one of the commissioners so chooses to make a motion to have John write it up, write up a, a change to the charter uh, amendment, and it would come back to us, and then we, we, we could still have this discussion. I mean, uh, we don't have the change in front of us right now that John would have to write. Um, so we still have time to talk about it, think about it, and maybe ask some constituents too of what uh, what their thoughts are on that so um, today is not a, a something that we're it's going to end we we still need the, the the written amendment to come before us so Corey 
Yeah, first I'd just like to thank you gentlemen for coming in to talk to us and giving us a very um, good insight onto why it's important for the, the city or for us as a, a commission to allow the city to make decisions to be a part of your organization. So I thank you very much for that. And thank you, Christina, for providing all of the background information. Um, for me, uh, I guess I'm more along the lines of Mark and Jim where uh, I feel like um, we should, especially the information that Christina provided with the, the mayor's support, the, the council or the, the, uh, uh, the city council support uh, of this decision, um, to me, uh, that that says that they want the ability to make these decisions for themselves, and and the kind of discussions, you know, Julie and I completely agree that that we need to talk about all of these things, and it's I'm glad that we have, um, but I guess I would like to make a motion then for uh, Attorney Shockley to draft um, the amendments necessary to the city charter um, that would allow the city council the ability to make the decision to um, join an organization such as the Fargo-Moorhead Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Corey. We have a motion on the floor. Do I hear a second? Second by Russ. Uh, discussion? Julian? Uh, can I ask that we have a roll call vote for this? You sure can. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, yep. and just to clarify, that's just to draft so that everybody's aware. It's just to draft the amendment and bring it back. You'll still have an opportunity to discuss it. And I, I, I normally don't jump out of my role as city attorney to talk about a policy issue, but I think it is the one thing that Charter Commission needs to be aware of is in the metro area, North Dakota cities don't have the same restriction. And so you have Fargo, West Fargo, and Horace is rapidly growing and some of the surrounding communities. Um, it's good to have a voice at the table, uh, even if you don't always agree with what the other parties are doing. Having a voice at the table can be really critical and having that stakeholder engagement. So. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Um, start out with on my right here, Mark. Yes. Russ. Yes. Athena. No. I will vote yes. Yes. No. Okay. So. Got it. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, John, please. On our when is our next scheduled meeting again? Uh, June. I think it's the third is it, uh, Wednesday in June. Yes. June 19th. June 19th. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, John will bring that back then, and we can continue that discussion then. Uh, in the meantime, I appreciate your insights, and uh, you gave us a lot of information, and I, we do appreciate that. And uh, again, thank you so much for being well, here today. Thank you for the time in front of this group, and if, if we can answer questions between now and the second reading, happy to. Thanks. Sorry for yep. drilling you out. No, no, no super it. seriously. Yep. Okay. So now, um, we also, at, oh, I'll wait for Dan to get back. Now we will move to uh, backtrack a little bit to item two. Okay. Um, uh, primary elections, and that would be another change to the charter. Um, and then uh, maybe I'll ask Dan to weigh in on this a little bit of uh, what would to. be involved here. So this is at the infancy stage. We have a resident that requested an amendment to the charter uh, that would involve a local primary. Uh, we have primaries at the county, state, national level. This would include that, I think. Um, so this isn't a discussion about whether we should do that today, but whether we, you know, if we want, if, to, talk about it. If we want to talk about it. Thank you. And, I'll, um, and I think that th this is probably a really good time. I mean, if we want to have a discussion on this, uh, uh, probably not today, but I think this is one that we can take back to our, our constituents, our neighbors, and uh, because I think there is a lot of issues involved in a, being in a primary. Um, one thing that comes to mind, um, 
uh, being a candidate myself. I mean, would that raise the cost for candidates? I mean, they're, they're actually basically running in two elections. I mean, so that's something to think about. Um, questions to ask, you know, your friends and neighbors, um, and uh, the pros and cons of it, you know. And like I said, the next election isn't a, a November of 2020. So, I mean, we have plenty of time to act on this. Um, but I think it's maybe a start of a, a discussion uh, for some of our future meetings. Um, but I'd like to hear some of the insights from any of the commissions, uh, commissioners that have any thoughts on this? Well, uh, yeah. um, primaries next year in 2020 are, um, uh, where uh, Minnesota has chosen to go into a, a, the Super Tuesday primary. Mm -hmm. So our primary will be in, on March 3rd. So would, are you saying that that's that's for that's parties. Th this uh, just this is just for municipal elections is the question, right? Um, so maybe uh, backtrack a little bit. The uh, super those sorts of primaries are within the party caucuses. Those are okay. this is not what we're touching so upon. So the state primary is still yes. August fifteenth. It would be the August fifteenth. Okay. Um, and the the concept that was brought forward is that currently under the city charter, you can have multiple numbers of people running for the same office. I'll use, for example, a city council uh, ward position. You could have 10 people running for the same position. Mm -hmm. uh, the request was to have a primary that would occur uh, during the state primary and narrow those number of candidates down to two, so the top two vote getters. Uh, from a policy standpoint, you could see a situation in which, so and this delves into kind of the the nitty gritty of the politics, so to speak. You could have two, even though uh, municipal elections are nonpartisan, you could have two people that are of the same political persuasion uh, running against each other. You could have, you know, that's just, just the top two vote getters. It's not a it's not a partisan issue. So whoever's the top two vote getters in that ward would then compete in the general election for that ward position. Same thing with the mayor. Currently, that is not how our system works. Um, when we started doing some research on the number of cities that had mentioned primaries in their charter, uh, there was about 200. Uh, actually, a little bit deeper dive into it. Some of them just referenced the primaries. They actually didn't have a primary runoff system for uh, city council members or the mayor. And so we don't have a precise number of how many are there, but we did identify some different charters that had uh, language regarding having a primary for a candidate for a city position like a city council member or the mayor. And so it, it's really a policy decision about whether you want to have a primary uh, for a city council position or the mayor uh, and then have the two top vote getters run off again, you know, go to the general. It, it, that is, I mean... It, the charter amendment would be really easy, uh, but there's a lot there's a lot of issues involved yeah. in whether you want to go down that route. And again, I think that's something that um, should be discussed with more than us, with some of the citizens, whether that's uh, whether that's what they would like to see or not. Um, from what I understand, uh, the county already has uh, a primary election that we went through. So I mean, there's really no. I don't think extra cost out of tax dollars to have a, because it's not a special election. There's uh, people are already going to vote anyway. Uh, there might be like extra cost to the candidates, you know, like I said. So, I mean, there are pros and cons to this. And I, I think uh, it's something we can discuss with uh, some of our fellow citizens. And if you're a member of some groups, try to get their input and what their thoughts are maybe. And then uh, we can, I mean, we've got, uh, basically a good year to act on this anyway if, it, if it's something that we decide to forward back to the council. So, um, Corey? One question I had on uh, Christina's letter that she sent out, uh, the section where she says, uh, some speculate that the exclusion of a primary was simply an oversight when the charter was changed in 2013. Um, does that um, insinuate that it at one time was a part of the charter that we used to have primaries? I don't believe so, John. Yeah, so I was part of the 2013 change from even or from odd years to even years. That was something primaries were not at all discussed by the Charter Commission. That was never within their discussion. Uh, in my research over the years through the Charter Commission, 
I, I've seen the different versions of the charter back to the 1890s, and they never discussed the possibility of primary elections. Uh, there was changes in voting requirements, there was changes in wards, but primaries were never never an issue. So I don't I don't think it was an oversight. It's just something that nobody's really talked about in never Moorhead. Considered. Okay. Not not to say that you can't add that if if you so want to. But I guess my suggestion would be is to you know talk it out with with people and uh, we can bring it back at a future meeting put it on the agenda if if so chose chosen so um, but it is something that we maybe want to consider looking at so any um, other discussion on that item I have got one question okay, mm -hmm. was there a reason this person that contacted you or wrote the letter or whatever did they have you know other than they'd like us to talk about it is there any not that I know of. Nothing? Yeah. They didn't, they didn't explain it. I would assume it come from maybe a ward or something that there was quite a few um, uh, candidates running. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had that question of why can't they vote on just two or one of two. So mm -hmm. you know, on a, that's my assumption anyway. So at yeah. a, at a, On the bigger picture, I mean, this is the question about you know requests that come from citizens and residents and and how they're approached and so what i hear you saying is we'll research this and if the chair asks that it may be included in a future agenda that's uh, that's when it would come on yeah. and that's another thing that's another way things can come to the charter if if any one of the citizens want, want to do the petition thing uh they can petition us to look at it mm -hmm. i believe it's uh five percent of the last registered voters or the uh that can bring it to us too. I mean, to me that would be a nice right because then we'd know the citizens are interested in it. Uh, but, um, oh. Mark, you look perplexed. I was thinking that the uh, petition system w went right to the uh, ballot, or went to the city council rather. I, I don't think it us came to here. Doesn't it, or does it go right to the ballot? I'd have to double. <laughs> It, well, it goes straight to the ballot. I think the the issue is if it comes to the Charter Commission just for cleanup in the council, because oftentimes it, there may also be action in there. And so if you receive a petition and the Charter Commission says, yeah, this is a great idea, uh, and that I think the City Council has so much time to just approve it or it will just go to the voters. I, I, I can research that process. But there, um, there's some there's some trigger times in there, but it would if the city council didn't act and the charter commission didn't act, it would clearly go to the voters. And I, I'm assuming that's probably it. I mean, you you said the word clean up, and I think that would be probably it. If if it was petitioned that way, John would have to write up an amendment to the charter. We'd have to look at it. I mean, say, okay, is this worded right, or is this the yeah. way we want it worded? Maybe. Right. And I, I think John's suggestion is absolutely right. I think if he would do some research and have it back to us for our next uh, meeting, that would be great because that, I think, would enhance our discussion. And what what type of uh, are, are you just looking for other cities that have it? And are you, are you looking for some policy kind of guidance on their experience with it? Maybe there's some information that Dan can add. Yeah. I guess my first comment, or my comment, was meant more towards um, just exactly how that process would be for petitioning. I'd also, yeah, if we could do a little more research in what's happening with charter cities in Minnesota, I think that would give us a nice discussion on a warm June day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I kind of look, in my mind, looking at schedule, and again, being a candidate, um, I think if this were a change that we felt was warranted to bring before the city council, we should re really kind of have it something to them in January or February so that so possible candidates would know. At one of our next two mm -hmm. or three meetings. Yeah, yeah, would know what the what the rules for 2020 would be uh, if we waited till June and made a decision. <laughs> uh, June of 2020, yeah, that 2020, might be and, and that's only. <laughs> And that's only about a year and a couple months away. So uh, I think getting a robust dis discussion started uh, at our next meeting would be warranted. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Julian? Um, I don't know how I'm gonna vote on this if we ever do bring it to a vote, but I wanted to say thank you to our manager um, 
because, you know, as someone who's worked in politics, and I think a lot of us here can attest to this, a lot of times it's easy to feel that we don't have a voice or that our opinions don't matter. Um, so when I saw that it was one concerned citizen uh, that brought this to you, uh, I, I, that would spoke to empowerment. So thank you for that. So with that, I guess we will just um, look for some more information from Don at our next meeting, at our June meeting. Um, any more discussion on that item? If not, we just have uh, something basically to clean up. Uh, back in 2017? <coughs> Certainly, yeah. Dan, maybe just highlight if, this. If you don't mind, I can summarize this quickly. Uh, so effective January 19, uh, the Charter Commission has 11 members, um, three at large, two from each ward, and this has been codified. This was a decision that would have been made um, by the Charter Commission in 2017, so it took a few years to get here, and we're there. And so this item basically um, just updates the Char Charter Commission's bylaws to reflect what's in the code. What we already voted on. And, and uh, Puts it in the bylaws officially for us. John. And, and the Chief Judge approved the reduction in the membership too. So okay. And he's been through this district court. This is just a cleanup. So uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve the amendment to our bylaws. Moved by Russ, second by Corey or Julian. Julian, uh, any discussion on that? Seeing none, uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And with that, we... Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark. Uh, question concerning the last meeting and I understand several meetings before the discussion of election va vacancies and open seats. Uh, it wasn't under unfinished business. Where is that hanging and is that something we should either put to bed or continue with? Uh, and that goes back to our Ward 2 thing, I believe, back then. Um, we asked for some input from the, this is off of memory <laughs> input from the council of how they would like us to proceed on that or if they would want us to proceed on that to some uh, to clean up the language basically in it um, I don't think we got any input back from the council on that Christine um, Mr. Chair Mr. Roxon, um I wasn't here when all that happened though you did ask that the council kind of consider, right, what to do. The council did have a discussion about it, and what I recall was they did say that um, they, that we have a policy, they have a policy, and they intend on following the policy in the future. I think the issue might have been that they weren't, um, the policy wasn't exactly followed possibly. I wasn't here, but um, they absolutely committed to following the policy in the future. So if you felt like you needed to do something else, but they weren't requesting it officially. Could we see what the policy is? Absolutely. We can send that electronically. Okay. That'd be great. And if, if I could uh, make a suggestion then, if once we see the policy, if that this could be brought forward next meeting on unfinished business, right. maybe we can finish it. Okay. John, did you have something to say? Yeah, so I can offer a little bit of background on what happened in the word the word two issue was I was asked to prepare a memo on the procedure a suggested procedure for filling the vacancy uh, the council then at that time followed a slightly different procedure and then went back to the procedure that I had uh, proposed uh, I think they're committed to following that procedure now uh, it's not not a nice clean looking document from the city we can certainly convert it into that just so that you know in the interest of providing uh, transparent information okay. I guess I for our next meeting I guess I would like to see too maybe um, what the charters you know we'll, we'll keep, we can have the charter in front of us but the charter states about it and then uh, a copy of their policy and we can kind of compare the two and uh, have a discussion from there seem fair I, I, he I hesitate to get in our next meeting and it's going to be a two hour meeting. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, so we can make well, it. Just, just having it for us to review and ahead of time and then I think just a quick decision from us uh, if we want to put that to bed or not, I think is in order. 
And when you you said you uh, you want to clean up that policy a little bit. Yeah, it was actually a memo that I'd prepared, so it wasn't, you know, the city has a nice format for policies, and it, it's just not in the nice, clean presentation form. It's in a memo from me. So. Is that anything they would have to approve once you clean it up to look at to, as a policy, as a policy item? I, I believe they did take it up at a council meeting, and, and they did affirm that they would follow it, so I don't think they need to approve anything else. No, it, as long it, as you it, don't change anything, they yeah. exactly. just clean it up. Yeah. And then I have one final ask, and that's as a new Charter Commission member, and I know we have a few others, could we at the next meeting get a hard copy of the Charter itself for, our, yes. for us to carry yes, around? I'm guessing. Packets. I think for the new members, I don't know if they've gotten a packet yet. I've got I mine. Haven't, I haven't have gotten not one gotten yet. Yours? Okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, maybe we could have a new one with all the updates in, too, because mine, yeah, we'll, we'll have a few updates. We'll put a nice little. You want to see this? See what they have in there. Yeah, I think you know. I think I have a copy of that in here, and so I'll just get that to all the new members. But, yeah, probably all of ours could be freshened up a bit. <laughs> yeah, because okay. we have our and bylaws have changed in our lab too. So, and I don't think they have to be mailed out because we all have electronic mm -hmm. capabilities. But it'd be nice at the meetings to have have it with me, with us. Yes, thank we'll you. We'll do. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mark. Um, Move to adjourn. With that, um, for the good of the order, we shall adjourn. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.